ahead and get started. Um, the microphone that's up there by the flip chart, that is the microphone that you'll speak from. Um, as soon as you are ready, I will call your name. I apologize in advance if I don't pronounce it correctly. Um, you'll have three minutes from the time you speak, and we've got a nice online time right here, so, um, so it will be fair for everybody. So I'd like to invite up our first First uh, speaker is Webster Wright Jr. My name is Webster Wright. Can you hear me? I'm a retired naval aviator. With a lot of combat time. In a former life, I was known as Sea Wolf 37. I've made a fact sheet, and I just want to run through this quickly so you can read it, but for more detail. For those that don't know, competitive shooting is the world's second largest participating sport after soccer, when you consider it in all the sporting forms of firearms. Shooting was the second sport that was picked for the Olympics after track and field in the Olympics. This is a biggie. National Public Law 10 requires United States citizens to be allowed to participate in training and competitive programs as part of the civilian marksmanship program using the current service rifle or its civilian counterpart. One of those documents refers to it. The current service rifle type is the M16, and the counterpart is the AR-15 type. The M16 is the longest lived service rifle in the United States service, even more than flintlock. There are more than 200 companies that make these rifles in this country now. A few words about who uses them. National Rifle Association, the Civilian Marksmanship Program, members through the clubs, are vetted, you cannot be a criminal, and belong to either one of those organizations. If they find out, you're gone. Most of the vetting is done through the clubs, such as Anne Arundel Fish and Game over here. I came back to the club, took me more than six months to get back in it because I had to pass the requirements, including a $100 check on my background. NRA <coughs> instructors train more than 50,000 police a year on average. Probably 60% of the NRA and CMP members are active duty, retired, or families of military police or other patriotic organizations. They are simply the best people we have in this country. Both the NRA and the CMP have provided instructors when the Army ran out in dire situations like World War II and Korea when they didn't have enough to cover. This is a big one to me because I spent the second day of Tet 1968 after the base has been run over, the next morning I had 40 sailors lined up trying to show them how to load and shoot carbines because nobody had shown them they would get on the job training. The current level of small arms training in the Navy and the Air Force is so low. The SEALs shoot up one half the small arms ammunition allotted to the Navy and there are about a thousand operators. That leaves the other 79,000 without a lot of ammunition per man and girl. Uh, so when a sailor or an airman buys a rifle or pistol and some ammunition, goes to a civilian range, it's not recreation. As far as I'm concerned, that's about the only military training he or she are gonna get. Not a lot of people are aware of that, but I've put 50,000 people through training programs and that's my experience. Is that the three minutes? Okay, gotta stop. Right, please read the paper, and especially the last paragraph, I put what I thought were some solutions on there after 65 years of small arms experience. Thank you. Okay, next we'd like to call up William Paul. Well done. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is William Polk. I have resided in Anne Arundel County since 1968, and I'm retired from a federal law enforcement agency. Uh, thank you for affording the opportunity for public comment on the committee's mission and work. First off, a concern to me is the composition of the committee. I see no representatives from the gun rights community in the list of citizen members. But I do see at least three members who are or have been affiliated with organizations that, in my opinion, seek to restrict the rights of law-abiding citizens. Interestingly, one comment from the minutes of the May 16th meeting states that, quote, the inclusion of responsible gun owners is necessary. However, that does not seem to have occurred. And an unattributed comment also in the minutes of the May 16th meeting states, 
that 90% of the populace agree with us and it isn't worth the time to engage the other 10%. Regarding this latter comment, it seems to speak volumes about the committee's possible direction. I would also suggest that the 90% figure might be a bit of wishful thinking or confirmation bias. I would also uh, suggest that the committee needs to understand that responsible gun owners are just as concerned about gun violence as everybody on the committee. The vast majority of gun owners that I have encountered professionally and in private life are reasonable and can be reasoned with. The ones I have come in contact with professionally and in private life are intelligent, well-educated, family-oriented citizens in occupations such as law enforcement, medicine, the law, academia, the military, business, and the trades. The deliberate exclusion from the committee of these responsible gun owners will, I fear, possibly taint the product of the committee in the eyes of many county citizens due to this lack of gun owner participation and input. Lastly, and I will be brief, I feel the gun violence is symptomatic of, and a subset, only a subset, of the overall prevalence of violence in our society today. I think it behooves the committee to look into the root causes of violence in all its manifestations, focusing only on gun violence as articulated in the committee's very own definition of the same. And to the exclusion of all other means of inflicting harm is nothing more than treating the symptom of violence and not the cause. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Hi. Next, I'd like to call up James Chen. My name is James Chen. I live in Annapolis at uh, 1714 Baltimore Annapolis Boulevard. I recently retired as a research physicist from the Naval Research Laboratory. In a previous meeting uh, of the task force, I heard discussions by community leaders representing schools, medical providers, government offices, and uh, gun owners. The gun owners were offering to help the community with tips for safety handling of guns, and the school and medical representatives discussed services for mental health needs and gun violence survivors. I was struck by the uh, lack of meaningful and specific discussions on the overabundance of high-powered guns and unfettered access to guns. I personally know four professional colleagues who were killed in a mass shooting at the University of Iowa by a gunman who legally bought a gun and trained himself at shooting, shooting ranges. He certainly knew how to handle guns expertly and safely. I have noticed that the national discourse on gun violence has not changed much over the decades. Um, a gentleman just read, a previous speaker mentioned that there were uh, about sh a competition shooting. Uh, I would note that there are world-class Olympic shooting teams from countries with effective and, and strict gun control. Uh, recently, mental health um, issues be have become a hot topic, as well as video games. Uh, so here's a question. How does one identify, a, a priori, a person with dangerous mental health issues before he becomes a, a, a mass shooter. How does one tell the difference between a good guy carrying a gun for the defense of the state and a bad guy carrying a gun on his way to a shooting spree before he opens up, that is? I submit to you that there is no reliable way to predict that. So why should anyone expect different results from those of the last four decades by continuing to sidestep the fundamental issues that lead to the need for survivor uh, services for uh, gun violence survivors and so forth. That is the overabundance of guns and unfettered access to guns. And finally, why has the constitutional right to life of tens of thousands of people not to be shot to death been allowed to fall through obvious loopholes? These are the people who have been shot to death in years past and who will be shot to death in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next, I'd like to call up Margaret Whiteside. Hello, I'm Margaret Whiteside. I live in Arnold. It's really closer to the mic. We can't hear you. It's really true that gun violence in America is out of control. It's much worse. It's getting worse. 
and it's kind of insane. Um, I've recently learned about another country that has just as many guns per capita as the United States, but its last mass shooting was in Parliament in 2001. Uh, how is this? What country is this? Well, the rules are very strict. There's a lot of respect for guns. Everyone must learn how to use them, and there's mandatory service, service to the country required. But all guns must be registered. If you are given a gun by your grandfather, you still have to do the paperwork. You must present to the proper, proper authorities proof that you have no criminal record, that you have been trained as to how to use the gun. This makes it much easier for the authorities should there be a problem. There's also a two-week mandatory waiting period uh, before you can purchase a gun. All ammunition must be stored separately from the actual firearm. Uh, they have way fewer mass shootings than the United States. I realize that there's other shootings and suicide, which are really terrible problems that we have here in this country. But I think that we really need to look. We really need to look at being stricter with our gun control. Um, what country is this? It's Switzerland. And they love their guns just as much as we do here in America. You know, I really don't have a problem with policemen having guns, Olympic shooting teams having guns. I think it's great. But I do have a problem with the people who have fought against registration for guns, universal background checks. In a democracy, we are supposed to be able to work out our differences by compromise for the good of the greatest majority of the people. And I find it very selfish of some of the gun owners who are here that they aren't waiting, they are not willing to compromise on universal background checks, red flag laws, mandatory waiting periods, and mandatory gun registration. What are you afraid of? Me? Are you afraid of the truth? Are you afraid? Because if you are a law-abiding citizen, you should have nothing to be afraid of. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Whiteside. We have called down the audiovisual uh, technician. He's going to turn the volume on the microphone. But I'd like to keep going. Um, and if, if our next speaker, Mr. Brian Swift, could just speak directly in the microphone and project, we'll, we'll be good. Thank you. Absolutely. Good evening. My name is Brian Swift. I'm a lifelong member of uh, or president of Anne Arundel County. Um, I wanted to run through a couple of points with you guys. Um, in addition to being a lifelong um, resident of the county, I am also, uh, uh, I've literally trained thousands of people in the safe and effective use of firearms for free for over 12 years um, and with, a, with a national organization as well as other local organizations. Um, my major concerns with, um, with this, this, this group is, is the first one is the composition of the board. Um, I see no one here who has anything uh, uh, other than, than one, one viewpoint for the most part. Um, I, 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 I see several people here from organizations, either current, past, or present, that are validly um, uh, anti-gun. Um, I see zero uh, people from the other side of the equation. Um, there, there, there may, may be a day in the future where the political pendulum swings and being locked out of the discussion, which gun owners at least have the, uh, the appearance that we are locked out of this discussion, um, it's not a good place to be. Um, so please factor that into your board composition and any future decisions. Um, the other uh, issue that I have is with the broad redefinition of what exactly constitutes gun violence. Uh, basically, gun violence is now whatever you guys say it is. Um, why not use a definition from a neutral source that is already in existence? 
Um, if you want a predetermined outcome that says, okay, gun violence has spiked and I can show you on the numbers, then simply redefine it to include anything having to do with guns. In, you know, right now, uh, you can include uh, the lawful use of firearms in self-defense can now be considered gun violence under your guys' um, definition that you guys uh, had in your last board meetings. So, looks looks like a pre-desired outcome is is what we're what we're up against here. Um, I don't need any more time. Thank you guys, and uh, hopefully you will try to be more inclusive. Um, yeah, people with opposing viewpoints to your. So next is uh, Robert Becker. Okay, my name is Robert Becker. I've lived in Maryland except for military time all my life in Edron County about 80% of the time. I did four years in the Air Force, 26 years as a police in Baltimore City, uh, Northwest District. <coughs> I can't see where all these gun restrictions are going to do anything to decrease the amount of violence. Uh, I picture it as a society's problem. Uh, they had prohibition to stop the drinking, and that didn't work. There's, it's against the law to have drugs. That hasn't stopped anything. To stop the violence, it's going to have to be start at uh, start at the root causes, and that's better education, giving people a reason to live. If you, if you go to a school and they'll give you an education and you have no skills and you come out, you have no reason to go on except to sell drugs, and that's where the gun violence is. As a police, to the best of my knowledge, I've seen a lot of homicides. And I can't think of any case where a gun was used that was bought lately. I bought a rifle over the internet. That rifle was sent to Clyde's uh, licensed dealer in Lansdowne. They did a background check on it. I have no, nothing against background checks. I want background checks so we know who has the guns. But the people that are using these guns are not buying them to the stores. They're stealing them or burglaries or whatever. I also uh, had a transfer of a handgun from one person to the other. Both of us had to submit forms to the Maryland State Police. It was about, I think it was a 10 days, I'm not sure the correct time. It was about 10 days before we got um, authorization to transfer that gun from one person to the other. To stop the violence, it's got to be done at the base level, and that goes back to school, back to education, and give people a reason to live. Uh, people are going to buy, people are going to get guns. There's millions of guns on the street, and there's not that many people that's using them for illegal purposes. I started hunting when I was 14. Uh, I don't do it anymore. I just don't do it. I do target shooting. I try to shoot clay pigeons, but I don't hit too many of them. I do target shooting. Um, and the last thing in this world I want with a gun is to hurt anybody. I don't want to hurt anybody with anything. But gun laws is not going to do it. It's got to start at the base level, and that's at the education and so forth. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Becker. Thank you. Okay, next up is uh, Mr. Roland Kerrigan. Yeah, my name is Roland Kerrigan. Currently, I'm a member of the Anne Arundel Fish and Game Association. Every Friday, I shoot trap, uh, like probably some of you who play bridge once a week. Um, I just like shooting trap. Uh, back in uh, <clears throat> when I was about 10 years old, my father bought me a 10 gauge, uh, 12 gauge shotgun, a single barrel, which I went rabbit hunting with and, and squirrels to help feed the, 
uh, <clears throat> the family. Uh, when I lived in Levittown, Pennsylvania, I belonged to the Lang Langhorn Riding Gun Club where I competed with 22, 38, and 45 and a 36 rifle, mostly at Fort Dix when I lived there. Uh, after, as I said, I spent 17 years with NSA. After I left there, I went to the FBI where I retired from. And I see nothing wrong with uh, handling guns. I've had lots of training uh, all through the years. And especially when I joined the club, uh, they're very security conscious. So <clears throat> it's a matter of uh, if someone's uh, shouldn't have the gun, uh, such as those who are mentally deficient, they should have uh, background checks. And I'm in favor of the very secure background checks. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Thank you, Next is Wallace Chance. Good evening. I didn't plan to speak when I came here tonight. I just wanted to come and listen to what I am. Um, I, I, I've heard a lot of people talk, but basically what I see is whenever we address gun violence, everybody's pointing the finger at me. I've spent my entire life uh, crime free. I'm not a bad guy, and I've been uh, using firearms for several decades now. And I think as one of the other gentlemen said, our problem is really not with the gun, but actually with the society. And I think our education system needs to start at a very early age teaching people how to act. Most people don't even know how they're supposed to act in society, and that's where our problem lies. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Next on our list, Eloise Ullman. My name is Eloise Altman. I live in Annapolis. No civilian should own an automatic weapon, period. Forget background checks and other flaccid tweaks to our laws that have proven not to work. I understand single shot rifles for hunting and sports, and I understand target pistols for competition. But why do private citizens need human being killing machines? Automatic weapons only purpose is to kill people. So why are we so surprised that men purchase these weapons and then kill people? If I walk into Ace Hardware and purchase an item designed only to dig holes, we can assume I'm gonna dig holes. Likewise, what do purchasers of these weapons plan to do with them? We must demand that weapons of mass destruction of human beings be totally removed from our society now before more school children, mall shoppers and churchgoers are murdered by perfectly sane U.S. citizens packing killing machines they bought legally with background checks, etc., etc. I recommend the following. We open our eyes to what's happening. Automatic weapons wielded by men who are U.S. citizens are killing innocent people. We stop using words like slippery slope and quoting the Second Amendment. We stop being afraid that radical measures won't work because of the power of the NRA and legal constraints. Oops. Four, sales and use of automatic weapons be made illegal immediately with a 10-year mandatory sentence for anyone selling or possessing any of these weapons and or ammunition. This done on the state level since our National Congress refuses to address this national emergency. Five, owners and sellers of these weapons have a six-month window to turn in their arms. Maybe we could replace their people-killing machines with paintball guns. <laughs> Ask local law enforcement for ideas and strategies. And finally, expect the NRA to lead this effort by becoming what it professes to be and is not, an association of responsible sport gun owners. Yes, there will be legal challenges. Let's ask the ACLU and state and local law enforcement for help. We all must summon the courage to take extreme measures. I want peace to again be the hallmark of life in America, and I will never, 
ever again take for granted? Is it asking too much to once again enter my school, shop at Walmart, or worship in my church without fear of an AK-47 wielding Rambo wannabe waltzing, whoops, waltzing through the door to mow down as many innocent random people as possible? We thought it could never happen in Annapolis, how wrong we were. All automatic weapons and ammunition must be banned from private ownership now. Thank you, Mrs. Holmes. Next, uh, George Hollis. Good evening, I'm George Hollis. I'm a resident of Arnold. Uh, and a taxpayer here. In logic class in college, and you all did take logic, didn't you? There was an argument or a proposition made that it is extremely difficult to arrive at a valid conclusion based upon a false premise. So the false premise here is that guns are the problem. And this process has proceeded from that false premise. In the Behavior Health Subcommittee report presented the last meeting, the top line said, this isn't a gun problem, it's a violence problem, to which I wholeheartedly agree. I'm a target of opportunity in both of my professional capacities. I'm subject to being hit over the head and robbed at any time. Now it doesn't matter to me whether I'm beat up, whether I'm knocked down and kicked, whether I'm hit over the head, whether I'm stabbed, or whether I'm shot. In either case, I suffer the physical consequences of that attack. That's something of violence. And as someone else has said, this is a deep-seated problem. It runs deeper than just talking about guns. As I'm sure the Bishop and I will agree with me from the book of Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can doubt it? We have a flawed process here. The process was set up to, to achieve a certain outcome. And the committee, the task force, was established to move in the direction of driving that outcome. That's even at the cost of making outsiders and uh, opponents of people who do not entirely agree with that original premise. And this is very, very bad. Third, something I call, because on these points, I lay the people who organize the task force, not the people at the table. Okay? Or something called the cool kids table. Do y'all remember that from school? There was a cool kids table, and you were either one of the kids at the cool, table, cool kids table, or you weren't. This people on this task force had the possibility of being the people at the cool kids table. The thing about the cool kids table is there's an attitude of exclusivity. There's an attitude of superiority with regards to knowledge and ability. And those of us sitting on the side attending these meetings have experienced that. We've been treated as the people who were not at the cool kids' table, and that's on y'all. That's not on the people who set up the task force. Now, one of my good new friends, Rob Hamlet, has told me and advised me not to complain, but to make a suggestion. So that's what I'm gonna do. To the kids at the cool kids' table here, there's a lot that you don't know, and there's a lot that you don't know that you don't know, particularly when it gets down to the nuts and bolts. My suggestion is that you invite outsiders to participate in committees at the committee level as subject matter experts. Bring these new insights and these ideas in to help to strengthen what's coming out of this as a tail end report. If you do that, I think we'll produce a better product. Thank you, Mr. When I was growing up in South Baltimore, most of my friends had guns. We hunted with shotguns or 22s. I was a member of the Southern High School rifle team. Yes, there were guns in Baltimore City schools, and no one was shot. Several of the schools had gun ranges in the school building. As a teenager, a friend and I would get on the number six bus with our gun in hand, then transfer to another bus which took us down Mountain Road near where 100 intersects now. Then we would walk to a woods where we 
had permission to hunt. No one cried for the police. No one ran in fear. We go from, how do we go from here with little gun violence to where bodies now are added every day to the body count list? What happened to the country to get us to this point? <clears throat> the number of homes that have guns has not changed. If you believe the press, the reason for introduction of assault weapons when in, um, it was the introduction of assault weapons, when in fact they have no functional difference than other semi-automatic weapons. Semi-automatic. Lady said automatic. There are no automatic weapons in the assault weapon ban, or assault weapons as defi <clears throat> defined, excuse me. These are semi-automatic rifles. No more accurate. They don't shoot faster. They don't shoot more. They just shoot one round per each pull of your finger. They are not machine guns. The members of this panel have been chosen carefully by the county executive not to find the real cause of violence, but to lay the blame on guns and demand more laws restricting their purchase. It is like saying people that are getting fat, the problem is the fork. I contend the cause of violence are seeing, that we're seeing is the result of the devaluation of human life and the unwillingness to hold people accountable for their actions. In 1973, Roe v. Wade said, it is legal to kill what had been up to that date a baby. It said what was a life yesterday is now an inconvenience. Later, <clears throat> last year, we saw the legislature in New York stand up and cheer when they passed a law allowing babies to be murdered right up to the time of delivery. If we say this is okay, why is it not okay to take your life or the life of your loved ones? We establish commissions and studies. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. And if you would like to provide us with the written testimony that you were unable to finish, I'm happy to distribute that to the task force. Next on our list is Alexandra Montiela Novak. My name is Alexandra Matia Novak, and I'm the Annapolis area co-lead for the Maryland chapter of Moms Doing an Action for Gun Sense in America. The Annapolis local group is made up of hundreds of volunteers throughout Anne Arundel County, including gun violence survivors, gun owners, community members, faith leaders, veterans, and retired law enforcement. I agree it's important that gun owners are involved in the gun violence prevention debate. That is why I'm here, and why I'm a volunteer with Moms Doing an Action. I'm especially concerned because gun violence, not any kind of violence, but gun violence specifically, is the second leading cause of death for American children and the first leading cause of death for African American children, which is completely unacceptable in demands action. I was raised to view gun ownership as being just as much of a responsibility as a right. I reject the false idea that you can't be both a gun violence prevention advocate and a gun rights advocate. I'm respect, respectful of the fact that there are people involved in this task force that are gun owners and support both gun violence prevention and gun rights. The majority of gun owners, like me, support stronger laws, universal background checks, emergency risk protector order laws, and requiring gun licenses all get brought bipartisan support as well as the support of the majority of gun owners. 77% of gun owners support expanded background checks. 62% support a national emergency risk protector order law, and 57% support requiring a license before purchasing a gun. There are a few that say herbal laws are unconstitutional, and the work that we put into passing the herbal law in 2018 was a waste of time. That perspective is completely wrong and does not represent how the majority of gun owners feel about these types of laws. Instead of being a big waste of time, it has actually been proven to be a very effective 
to of our law enforcement. And I'm really grateful to our law enforcement because we become a model for the rest of the country. And they make it easy for gun owners to support these types of laws at the national level, which the majority of us do. We support the task force work and would like to urge you to keep going and continue collecting data, having discussions, and looking for policies that have been implemented in other cities and counties and have proven to reduce the risk of gun violence. We would like to see the county do more public awareness about the herbal law. And based on what I've heard from the county police that the majority of crime guns in Anne Arundel County are being stolen, we would like to see more public awareness about safe storage. Also, nearly 100 Americans die every day from gun violence with two-thirds being suicides. Unfortunately, gun suicides are more prevalent in rural counties, and I'd like to ask the task force to look into what is being done in the rural parts of our county to mitigate this very real risk to our community. As a gun owner, I am encouraged to know that there are other gun owners on the task force, and that everyone on the task force res respects our Second Amendment rights, and they have confidence in the current representation of community leaders and public health and safety experts to achieve their goals and make our county safer. Thank you, I'm Charlie Windsor. I'm a 50 year plus president of Van Arnold County. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you and to present some comments. Uh, much of what I've heard is some things that I was going to say. Um, I am also concerned about the, I support the fact that there is a violence task force, I, the myopic view that it is a gun violence task force. Uh, there are other types of violence. I think that uh, one of the ways to take and perhaps, uh, I think we all work together on this, one of the ways to do it is to take and have, uh, we have law enforcement does a great job, we have uh, courts that sometimes do a great job, but when you get people that are committing crimes and are being let out or being given very light sentences and such, I think that some of the things that need to be done uh, actually could, if all of us work together to get the court systems and some of the other systems to take it, then actually put some real teeth in laws that already currently exist. Uh, speaking for most of the gentlemen that uh, have spoken, uh, I think that uh, collectively, we've probably got uh, thousands of hours of uh, training. Uh, we have probably conducted thousands of hours of training. Uh, we have slapped hundreds of thousands of rounds, and I don't know any of the people that have spoken or people that I know in the club that, to which I belong that have ever committed any kind of crime and have no intention to. Um, I thank you for your opportunity and uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Good evening, my name is Daryl Hodge, I'm a resident of Arnold. I'd like to drag this task force to two key points. The first one being suicide. Pew Research Center, every, all the experts that I've seen say two thirds of gun violence is suicide or suicide related. And I wish I had the answer there. In one of your early meetings, Ms. Leitis alluded to people who don't have connections, people who lack connections to their community, their schools, their family, their and their God, are often without hope and often turn to violence against themselves. I mourn this. I wish we could do something. I am by nature, and yeah, my wife says by nature, by training and by education, by experience, an engineer. I understand intent is far more than I understand the human heart. But I wish that the experts on this board, the experts that you have access to, draw upon them and address the issue of suicide. That's two thirds of gun violence. If we could reduce that, it would be huge. The other focus that I would like to see from this task force is illegally owned handguns. Of all the guns used in crime, 80% are illegally owned. It's not the responsible gun owners. It's not the people owning hunting rifles or shotguns. It is illegal handguns. That has to be another focus. If you on the task force can find ways to reduce crime using illegal handguns, to reduce drug and gang violence, which is about 20 to 25% of all gun violence, and the two thirds that is suicide, 
that would be huge. It doesn't require a focus upon legal gun owners. It really doesn't. There are a whole bunch of other things. So if I see recommendations that come out of this task force that address things like suicide and illegally owned handguns, I'll know that you are serious about gun violence. If I see recommendations coming out of this task force that address legal gun owners or people owning hunting rifles or shotguns, then I will know that you are not serious and that your focus is only on gun control. Please, suicide, illegal handguns, drug and crime violence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Next is uh, James McGuire. Uh, good evening. My name is James McGuire. Uh, I work here in Hannibal County. Um, let's jump right to the point. Adrian Mickler, you put up a slide at one of the previous meetings that your very first slide, very first bullet item was we don't have a gun violence violence problem, we have a violence problem, and I want to commend you for hitting the issue on the head. That spot on it is exactly what you guys should be addressing because violence from our society uh, is the core. If you have one takeaway, one tangible element that you get from this participation is that we have a societal violence problem. Um, and that violence spans ethnicity, it spans gender, it spans age, it spans income, it spans social status. Uh, I brought a couple of examples from this month. Uh, Derek Owens uh, committed an act of violence with a knife. Uh, Shakana Kendricks uh, beat the hell out of someone was stealing her car. Um, uh, Prince Kuchember uh, committed first degree assault with a pan. He hit another student in high school with a fry pan. Uh, and Chun Young Oh has been charged with first and second degree murder because she got into an altercation with her neighbor in her garden and she beat her neighbor to death with a brick. All right, and don't think that the brick was an isolated incident because last year, uh, Jason Miles Roger committed pretty much the same thing. He beat his neighbor to death with a brick. And uh, what do all of these have in common? The core thread is it's violence. It's not gun violence. It's not knife violence. It is not cookware violence, and it is certainly not brick violence or masonry product violence. And if, you're, if you think that's silly, it, it sounds silly, but why would you say, oh, we're not going to call that brick violence, but you're more than willing to call gun violence gun violence? It doesn't make any sense because the core is actually violence. And you could take a dump truck of magic fairy dust and make the firearms go away and all knowledge go away and you still have to address the violence issue. It's just going to move somewhere else. People committed to committing violence are going to find a way. They're going to pick the method that is most expeditious to complete that task. Whether it's self-inflicted, suicide, or inflicted on other people, they're going to find a way that is effective. If you're, if you're intent on committing suicide, you're not going to choose a method that's likely to fail. You're going to choose the best one at your disposal. And whether that's a knife or a gun or jumping off a bridge, you're going to find whatever is available. And you could, make, like I said, make the firearms go away and the violence is going to move somewhere else. The objective really needs to be addressing violence at a societal level. And it's not a public health issue. It is a societal issue and potentially a cultural issue within certain groups. They embrace violence as a first solution to the problem as opposed to being an absolute last resort. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Don Patterson. Hi. Good evening. My name is Don Patterson. My comments are, are meant to design to really complement what your uh, your work here is that any gun violence. Um, for me, it is, uh, I think in Washington we have a unique opportunity um, to put pressure on President Trump to do what I believe he knows is the right thing and support universal background checks and red flag legislation. The, uh, I feel strongly that if uh, the President directs Mr. Connell to uh, arrange a vote in the Senate, then change will occur. And he's a Pivotal person for that. 
Um, I think uh, I do write to the president and give him my viewpoint at times. And uh, in terms of this particular topic, yesterday's letter, you know, suggested that uh, I know uh, from my perspective, Mr. President, that uh, you very much are in control and of the life or death of future gun victims. And I strongly urge you to do what you know is the right action to take. Um, people may ask, does one email to the White House make any difference? I would contend it does. Uh, they're very much a tally commerce there and everything, and all presidents have had that. And so I think that uh, personally, I think it's important to uh, a message that may be different than the common message coming from the White House, I hear from other folks as well. So I, I would encourage you to, to take that few minutes opportunity. I think right now it is sort of a unique opportunity. It's on the front burner, it doesn't mean it's gonna, things are gonna happen with it, but it's a chance for uh, change to take place and uh, a little bit to push from the, the rest of us on the other side. I think uh, optimistic may be helpful. Thank you. Charles Grimpler, I'm a Suburban Park resident. Um, I'm uh, you're tasked with finding and writing a law that stops the problems that we have. The problem is you can write a law to stop what you can, but you can't write a law to stop what the problem is. The problem that I've seen, I've looked over the uh, uh, mass shootings that have gone on, a frequent number of the people, more than like 70 or 80 percent, have, have uh, been youth who have been on a various psychotropic drugs from when they're young ages. The, the Florida shooting recently uh, uh, had, a, had a similar thing. People haven't, uh, are given these drugs by their doctors. That information cannot be shared. You cannot make the uh, HIPAA laws open enough to allow that information to get into them. And if you did it in the county, it would be anywhere else. You wouldn't be able to get it into the federal database anyway. So if you're gonna have uh, people with drug problems like that who are taking these drugs, they go violent. Um, it's it's a mental issue. The same with the, the uh, suicide. People are there uh, are killing themselves far more than than uh, uh, the number of people who are actually being shot out on the streets. The uh, one 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 of the solutions for solving uh, the uh, suicide problems is there's been a lot of jumpers off of the Bay Bridge. Well, that problem is solved. The reason it's solved is they don't advertise it anymore. They don't say it happened. And so now the problem is just hidden. It's not there. So I'm absolutely, the, the, the misinformed people talking about automatic weapons, none of that stuff is valid. What, what I would suggest doing, somehow getting a, anybody over 12 who's on those drugs, um, make the pharmacy reported and get it into your, uh, the, the uh, registration so that they can know that those people are taking those drugs and prevent them until they're cleared by a doctor that they can sh then do that again. I've taught firearm safety for many years. I've uh, teach it for a variety of uh, agencies and so forth. Uh, make gun shooting safe. Uh, teach people how to be responsible. You're not going to make your responsible people follow the law. Thank you. Thank you. Elise, return. <laughs> Hello. 
mind speaking to the mic. I have a real light voice. Um, thank you for allowing me an opportunity to comment. And I want to thank the task force for all of the hours that you're putting into this. It's important. And I'm grateful as a, as a member of Anne Arundel County. Um, I just wanted to reiterate, we're hearing a lot of people say the same thing in terms of we need to be more inclusive. And in the task force, I hope that you'll look for ways to include some of the people who have felt that they were outside the process. <coughs> I think it's really important to be inclusive in this process. It involves all of us. And we'll make a better outcome if we get all of us together in the same room. We may differ on the approach, but there's a lot of people here who have spoken who have years of experience. They have knowledge and they have training expertise. And I think some of the things we can find common ground are um, things like gun safety, um, proper storage, trying to keep the guns out of kids' hands. Those are things that I think we can find common ground on. I hope the task force will seek that. One other thing I wanted to mention, when I went to the task force meetings, they're mentioning um, outreach and education as part of the multi-pronged approach to this. And I would just urge the task force, when you're talking about doing education or outreach, make sure you've identified who the audience is. And then you have to target your message to the people you're trying to reach. In other words, a lot of the people that we may want to reach may not be in the, um, in the country clubs or the civic associations or the social structure. They may be um, in non-conventional things where we're not typically used to going out to doing training. Things like um, they had a wonderful experience with the um, library system in Annapolis where they took the library into the mall. And it's been so successful that they've tripled the size of the facility there. So maybe reaching people at the mall, maybe reaching people in a barber shop, maybe reaching people um, in a sporting goods store. But let's think outside the box when we think about reaching out to the communities that need our help and need education and training and awareness. I think that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Hamilton. My name is Gail Travis Keene. I'm a former first grade teacher in Anne Arundel County. I want people to think about the children, the next generation. I have a daughter who is a teacher. I have many friends who are teachers. I can't tell you how much time is spent on lockdowns, on shooter drills. I know so many little kids who are afraid when this topic comes up. Think of the next generation. Thousands of dollars are spent on bulletproof glass, on uh, security systems in schools. Think of the children. Gun violence is leaving a mark on the next generation. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Louis Bracey. I live in uh, Hanover. And uh, as soon as this uh, commission was announced, I was under the impression that a county executive wanted immediate and quick solutions. Now, this is not to put down all the conversations about mental health, kids, uh, keeping guns out of the hands of kids, and things of those natures. But those are long-term processes. When we talk about mental health, we talk about all the things that have to go along with mental health, it's a long-term process. Uh, at the last meeting, I left with the chairman a solution. But before I get into that solution, I'd like to say that 80% um, of all guns owned in America are owned by white males. Over 90% of all the assault weapons owned in America are owned by white males. Now, if you don't understand the history of guns in this, America, in this country, you should watch a uh, PBS special on it that gives you the whole history as to how we got into the situation we're in now. Pacifying white males. And in the NRA, just like the current occupier of the White House, they're spoiled, rotten brats. They have gotten away and gotten almost every single thing that they have wanted. Uh, with these assault weapons up to the point. If you recall, we had an assault weapons ban yeah. before Ronald Reagan was assassinated, attempted assassination of Ronald Reagan. 
weak Democrats, and I want to say that clearly, because Democrats was in control at the time, allowed the bill to go away because they were afraid of a racist organization. And if you understand, if you don't understand, I want you to go home and find out the history of the NRA and see how far they go back. They go back to the KK Clay. It's not no misunderstanding, it's clear. The roots of where we are today started with the Ku Klux Klans that turned into the NRA. So when you look at all of that, and you look at who's carrying these weapons, or who's doing all these mass assaults, that goes back to the history. So the solution that I left with the chairman, and I gave to some of the politicians here who, again, I would say were weak because they don't want to address it, and I say it directly to the county executive, is they are not going to get rid of these high-capacity magazines. They're not going to turn them in. I'm going to tell you that right now. The white male's not going to do it. They're not going to turn in the assault weapons. They're not going to do it. But what you can do, if you are not a weak politician, is you can tax them. You can put taxes on the high capacity magazines. You can put taxes on the assault weapons. And, and if they don't pay the taxes on them, you can have them arrested. And don't say you can't do it. And I want to tell you, when you go back to the county executive, don't say you, he can't do it. He could do it in this county, and he could start a revolution. Tax the hell out of them, just like you tax prostitutes, and just like you tax drugs. Tax the hell out of them. And stop being a weak politician. <laughs> All right. Do we have any other any other takers? <laughs> and, uh, hi, my name is Rachel Pacella, and kind of like last time, I really just wanted to come up here and thank all of you for taking the time to do this and for doing it in such a thorough way. All of you are pretty busy people, and I figure that if you're taking the time to be here, you know, you're, uh, I'm looking forward to, to what you come up with, and I'm, I'm guessing you're not wasting your time here. Um, and that, that's about it. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and close out the uh, public comment period at this point. I want to thank everybody. Oh, 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 sorry? Oh, 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 oh. Okay. Good evening, everybody. My name is Pat Gorman, Anne Arundel County. The way I see it, it's a God-given right to be able to self-protect, to protect yourself and your, and your family and loved ones. Guns are the great equalizer in that. The more time, money, and other restrictions that you put on law-abiding citizens to purchase guns or ammunition, the more you deter law-abiding from being able to have a gun, preventing them from purchasing what is the most efficient means of protecting yourself. So this reduces your right to self-preservation. And we all know that the rich and powerful, both in government in private life, they all have guns, or they have bodyguards who have guns. Are their lives more precious than mine? I don't think so. So anything that is done to prevent me or other law-abiding citizens from getting guns is pretty much telling me that my life is less valuable. It's pretty cut and dry to me. So thank you. Thank you very much. And now we're closing out. Public comment period. Again, I want to thank everybody for coming. A um, few things, as I mentioned earlier, we, we are videotaping uh, all the public comments. That link will be available on the website for everybody to view. We'll also have it transcribed. Um, we'll have an opportunity for the task force to discuss uh, all of the comments that we've received, both the verbally here in these meetings as well as those that we've received in writing. Um, our next meeting, as a reminder, is next Wednesday. We're coming on Wednesday instead of Thursday. There's one meeting, September 25th, 6 to 8 o'clock. We will be back at Anne Arundel Medical Center in the Belgian Pavilion, Center floor, which is where we've been meeting the past few months. Um, um, so
So I look I do look forward to seeing everybody there and I'm going to pass it over now to Bishop Carroll who also has a few to say. Well, thank you for your courage and comments. And, but if I don't do something, I'll be willing to press on sit down and have a conversation with you guys about your ideas and what you bring to this task force. None of us selected each other to be on this task force. We were selected by the county executive. But the composition of the board is not our power. So I'm willing to have an all inclusive conversation with our members, people who have done this, talk with me personally. I've lost my son in the Carolinas. All of us are leaving in the building. This task force was formed was for the of mass shooting. And I buried 15 young African American men who were killed by illegal guns. And so we have to address that issue too. So if you can give me some solutions on stopping guns from entering into that my community, I'm really glad to hear about that. You know, the fact that in certain communities, it's poverty. That we haven't talked about. It's, 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 it's areas that have been defunded. It's people who are feeling oppressed. So we have two conversations going on here. We talk most about gun violence and mass shootings, but we are not addressed suicides. That black young African American men are being killed every day. I don't think any of y'all here who lost the son understand how it feels to personally lose the son to gun violence. So if you got some solutions about guns, getting them out of our communities, then I'm willing to talk to you about that and hear what you got to say. If you got some solutions to make everything safe, from the onset, we have never talked about taking away people's guns. We said we were for the Second Amendment. We're not against, it was about safety, it was about responsible guns in the communities. And so we never came from that perspective. So to say we want to take away somebody's guns, we're very misinformed about that. Because from the first meeting, we said that we've been out here to take over anybody's guns. We're about safety. This is about public health. So if you want to have a conversation with me about guns and gun owners, we can talk. If any idea that can stop somebody from losing their life, I welcome that. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Thank you for the opportunity and get my information. I'll stay right. Second. Second week. All right, we need to adjourn. Thank you.